Hello and welcome to another episode of the Back Nine Report. We are happy to have both Mike May and Kieran Clark joining us today to discuss the hottest topic in golf right now, the USGA and the RNA's fourth step in the golf ball rollback process. Last week, they gave notice and comment via a video alerting everyone to the possibility of rolling back the golf ball for professionals and the elite amateur. Kieran, I consider you to be an elite amateur golfer. Oh, Are yeah. you in favor of the pros playing a different golf ball than, than I would play? Well, I mean, elite amateur, I take that, you know, I, I wish that were true. Yeah. Uh, but the answer to your question is, yes, I do. Uh, I think it's a, a necessary step uh, that's been coming for a long time, decades, of course. Debates about golf balls and golf can go back literally centuries to the days of old Tom Morris and Alan Robertson and St. Andrews talking about the gutty ball and the feathery ball. But obviously in the past 25 years, we've seen distance on tour and the men's professional game grow just exponentially. And the quick, and I think it's, it's long overdue that some action was done about that. Uh, because ultimately, you know, where does it end? And that, to me, is the biggest thing. Uh, we're seeing golf courses on tour you know, stretch beyond their limits. We've seen Augusta National literally spend tens of millions of dollars to extend their golf course. Um, and the, the, the trend that is going on, it's not so much about this year or in the next five years, but in the next 10 to 15, 20 years, where does it go? Where does it end? And in my eyes, the way it's trending is it would be a stage where the professional game in the men's side, certainly with the distance they hit the ball, it would become increasingly one-dimensional, increasingly just difficult to watch and unsustainable uh, in so many different levels. So I, I completely support the action done by the USG and the RNA. Of course, some people say, Fred, they haven't gone far enough. And you know, Mike Wan said this the other day where it was like, well, some half the population will say, oh, you've, you've gone too far. And the other half will say, you've not gone far enough. And that's governing. But they're basically taking the, the pro game back more or less 15, 20 years in terms of a distance. And you know what? Golf wasn't too bad back then. There's a certain Mr. Tiger Woods that dominated it back then. And um, and to me, that's where we have to be because the game, you mentioned, obviously, the pros using a different ball from what you or I would use in, in recreational golf. Ultimately, Fred, the two games have never been more divided than what they are now. The level of play on the PGA Tour is far beyond anything else now in terms of the distance you hit the ball, the way they play, the courses they play. They play you know, routinely courses that are 7 500 on the, on, on the scorecard, even that short these days. So the games are very more divided than what they are now. So bifurcation is what they call it. That exists now naturally. So I'm for it for that sense, because ultimately golf courses on the tour will become increasingly obsolete, but not just that, also compromised, where you see courses have to extend themselves, they become more narrow, they become uh, you know, basic. Look at Augusta National as the best example of that. Not just is it increasingly longer than it used to be, it's also now, look at the greens. They're increasingly cartoonish, gimmicky, they're far too quick, and all that's done to is trying to restrain uh, the impact of distance. And that's the one golf club that can do that. All the other golf courses in the world don't have the financial means or the ability to do that. So, and one example for, I'll, I'll give you guys now is I remember being at the, um, the 2018 Open Championship at Carnoustie and I was standing behind one of the tees and I was watching all the players hit off tee with driver and they were taking out, it must have been, it's like a 480 yard par four and they were driving, it's very warm that week and very fast, but they were driving the ball 400 yards, flying it 340 through the air. They were bypassing all the bunkers, all the wonderfully created mounds and so on. And it, it made me think, these guys aren't really playing this golf course. They're playing about 20% of it really, because most of it isn't even in play for them. So when you or I play at Carnoustie or elsewhere, in my mind, we're actually playing more of the golf course than what these guys are. And it's only going in that direction. Uh, I think something had to be curbed on it. But of course, it comes to that philosophical thing here. And I think the debate you're seeing here, we're in kind of the, the hot take stage of this uh, scenario where everyone's coming out with their opinions and people are on either side of it all. Uh, I think it requires discussion and nuance. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on the technical side of it all. That will obviously be discussed in the years to come. But I think the way we're at right now is, to me, you have two sides of the argument, Fred. You have... The business of golf, which is the tour, which is titleist and so on. That's what they're about, the business of golf. And they're incredibly successful in that regard. And obviously, they don't want anything that interferes with that business quite naturally. But then you also have the game of golf. And that's what the RNA and the USG are there to protect and preserve the integrity of. They're two very distinct things. I care about the game 
not the business. The two have to work hand in hand, obviously. But I think the business of golf has had quite a good run in recent decades. And let's be honest, uh, the tour golf in the past few years hasn't been great from a reputational standpoint. So for me, it's about the integrity of the game of golf. That's what I care about. It's not about being right or wrong or which side you're on. To me, what do you care about? I care about the game. I care about seeing the best players test in a more imaginative way. Because ultimately, people talk about, you know, obviously the baseball scenario, what they changed the bats in the Major League Baseball. We've got tennis balls have changed on tour. You know, even running shoes and athletics have changed to accommodate stuff. But of course, those are, are courts, they're fields, they're pitches. They're you know very singular things. Golf courses are different. And what makes golf so special is that the golf each golf course is unique and they have been creatively, imaginatively, architecturally designed to test a wide variety of skills. And no skills, I don't believe, are being tested on tour anymore and haven't been for quite a long time. And... Uh, and to me, the, the golf courses are the one thing that don't have the, a real say in this. Let's give them a fighting chance. Because ultimately, I don't see why it's you know so outrageous to change equipment or change a golf ball. But yet, seemingly, it's fine to just extend 600 yards onto a golf course and add acres of rough and new bunkers and new this and new that. To me, let's give the golf courses a chance. Let's see these players who are still great. Maybe the players today are better than ever before. They've certainly got every advantage, Fred, because they've obviously got all the sports science, they've got track, man, all the computer analysis, all the fitness stuff. Maybe they are better than ever before. But what is also demonstrably true is that golf equipment has never been easier to hit than it is today, which is great for you or I, and especially great for these tour players who they have the skill set to get the maximum out of that. So it seems illogical to me that you or I would have the same equipment and use the same stuff as the guys who play at the very highest level would, because to me, the games are very more divided. And one final thing before I hand over to Mike is we have had bifurcation before in golf until the mid-1970s. The United States had a completely different golf ball to what we used everywhere else in the world. So when you know, Jack Nicholas came over to play in the Open Championship. He had to move to what they call the British ball, but it was used everywhere else apart from the US and Mexico. So we've had that golf ball actually went further than the American ball. The American ball was bigger, bigger than the UK one, but that existed until the mid 1970s. So that to me is even more of a bifurcation than what we're talking about here. That was bifurcation in the whole game. This here is just a slight distinction between the absolute top 1% and everyone else. And to me, that's part of the, the natural evolution of where golf's going to be. So I think there's certainly debates to be had about the detail and how it's going to be introduced. And there'll certainly be a lot of contention. And that's going to be the topic for the next three or four years. But the principle of it, I'm absolutely behind. And I think it's long overdue. So, Mike, we just heard uh, we just heard Kieran take the uh, the pro stance. He's for this uh, this rollback of the ball. And, and you heard the reasons why. But I think you have maybe a little different take and maybe the general population uh, maybe is not so much for this thing. Uh, what are what are you what's your take on this, Mike? What's your thinking? Well, first of all, I'm gonna, uh, I think Kira's made some very good points and I, I can't disagree with too many of his points. But I think there's a uh, the side I'm taking today. And by the way, I do have one hole in one in my life. And that was made with the old British ball, the old Dunlop 65. <laughs> uh, so I uh, have fond memories of the old ball, the big ball American and the small British ball. But uh, uh, to my point, where do you, I know that uh, I have read the release from the USGA, the RNA, and I know that both organizations have been in touch with manufacturers, which is a good idea. Uh, I've got a, a background in the sporting industry where, uh, for a long time, governing bodies and sports were making a, decisions on equipment without consulting the manufacturers. So I think that uh, it's important for the RNA and the USGA to fully understand what it takes to make a golf ball. And also, how many golf balls are we talking about that they'll be making for the elite number of players? It's a bit of a an issue to say, okay, over here we're making the, the professional balls, uh, and over here we make the balls for the rest of the population. Another thing that I I struggle with is where do you draw the line? We have women professionals who are tremendous golfers, uh, many of whom really don't hit the ball too much further than some of your best amateurs, though there are some ladies who do hit it 300 yards, like Lexi Thompson. Um, if we were to roll back the golf ball, 
we would take away the chance for further historic moments like we saw in 1960 when Arnold Palmer drove the eighth, first green on the fourth round at Cherry Hills to win the U.S. Open and shoot 65. Do we all not remember when Jack Nicholas took off the sweater in 1970 and drove the 18th green at St. Andrews in the old course to get into a playoff and, and defeat uh, Doug Sanders? Um, Bryson DeChambeau got all beefed up to hit the ball a ton. Uh, I think he's begun to realize that Henny a ton is not always the key to success. So these, these highlight moments um, might be taken away. Another thing that we, we had in our past, when Phil Mickelson uh, pushed his golf ball off the 18th tee at, uh, I think it was Wingfoot, and, and ended up losing that U.S. Open, would that shot have happened uh, then if we were using these new golf balls they're talking about? I don't know. Um, the... Uh, and I'm glad to see that they're still open to comments from manufacturers until through August of this year. This rule would not take place until 2026. So it's not a done deal from what I can tell. Um, and uh, I just think that, uh, again, where do you draw the line between the elite amateur? I mean, there's times that I go out and play and I'll play nine holes like an elite amateur. Uh, and then the next day I'm not an elite amateur. So uh, I just think it creates some fuzziness and gray area that um, we don't need in golf. And I, I want to go out and see these great players uh, do wonderful things. And yes, I, uh, I don't like the fact that we're having to extend golf courses and make the greens trickier, as Kieran said. But uh, in the end, uh, we do putt for dough and we do drive for show. And let's not, let's not take the show out of golf. You know, listening to both of you, a couple things come to mind. Uh, number one, uh, Kieran, you made a really good point uh, talking about Augusta National because they do keep expanding that golf course. And the problem is that as that golf course was designed originally by Alistair McKenzie and, and, uh, and, and Bobby Jones, and, uh, and they, it was made to hit into the hills just right or, you know, to, to the, the tee shots were land in certain spots. And now that is all negated by the length of ball is traveling. So they fly over those hills and they hit the down slopes and they get the ball even farther. That's why they keep expanding these tees back so that the ball lands in the spots that they want it. So that's to your point, Kieran, that the golf courses have to be changed because the ball is going so long. You just go over all the trouble or it doesn't, the, the golf course doesn't show its true character. Yeah. The other point I want to talk about just real briefly is that one of the great allures of golf for the casual golfer or the amateur golfer is that he can go to these golf courses that the pros play that they see on television, play the same ball, play the same course and say, oh, yeah, I saw this guy do this. And oh, wow, I made a par on this or a birdie on this. So that's not such a great deal. So where do you stand, Kieran, on the fact that the, the average golfer wants to play the same as the pros? Well, I mean, th does the average golfer go to... I don't know, uh, the, the old course at St. Andrews or, you know, Pebble Beach. And do they play from the exact same tees? Are they playing the exact same tournament conditions? Are they playing the exact same pins and green speeds and rough uh, level? The answer is no. Um, so I, I really find that uh, hard to, I'm very skeptical of that perspective because people say the same thing about going to watch a golf tournament and uh, you, you want to see the big hitting and so on. I, I find it very hard to believe that someone's going to stand behind the tee and watch Rory McIlroy absolutely smoke a drive and then they'll say to their friend, uh, wait a second, let me check the GPS here. Oh, no, I, that only went 310. I'm not going to clap for that. That's not good. No, 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 no. I find that very difficult to believe. And, and what Mike said there before, Fred, about the, um, the magical moments that he mentioned, obviously, Palmer in 1960, Jack in the old course, you know, those legendary moments, they happen all the time now. They're not legendary anymore because you guys guys play the 18th for the old course. Nicholas driving that green downwind at the time, massively downwind, was a major deal. Now, now it happens every every player at the open last year drove the green, basically. It's a long par free. So those magical moments don't happen anymore because now everyone's doing them. Now, is that because the players of the day are better? Maybe. But they also have these ridiculous advantages with the equipment they use. I want to see these players uh, sh to show how good they actually can be. Uh, because ultimately, you know, right now, pro golf at the highest level in the men's game is more or less just drive, wedge, putt, that's it. 
we don't see guys hitting woods into par uh, par long par fours anymore or even par fives that doesn't happen anymore you know three irons two irons they're non-existent and um so while the players of the day might be better the game is unquestionably easier and that's good for for us as average golfers but why should the players on tour have that advantage too when they already have all the other advantages of actually being pretty good at golf? And to me, to make a distinction, obviously Mike was quite right there, is where do you draw the line in terms of elite amateur? And that's where the conversations come in. How far does that go down? Does it go down to college level? Does it go down to you know that kind of thing? All these things are to be discussed in the years to come. And yeah, there's a grey area there. And yes, it requires a, a degree of nuance. But I think that's where the conversations should start. I think it's important to have these conversations. I don't think it's healthy just to shut them down and say, well, we shouldn't change anything because, as I say, this is where we are right now with Augusta National extending the 13th by 50 yards. Where are they going to be in 10, 20 years? I mean, that, that that's it. And that to me, that the RNA and the USG have to sit above the manufacturers on this and the tour, which is also part of the business of golf, and look at what's better for the game. Yeah, it's a very small percentage of the game, but what is the best for that? And of course, you know, Mike was quite right there about the um, the manufacturers and obviously Titleist being the market leader are the most vociferous about their complaints about it, but it also presents an opportunity for another manufacturer to offer alternatives. And I saw, for example, Bridgestone were much more amenable in their statement regarding the, the RNA and USG. They were saying, well, we're very glad that they spoke to us, they're transparent, and we'll we'll We'll, just, we'll talk more of them in the future. So, you know, these restrictions or whatever are changes, they lead to innovation. And uh, I see potential innovation to come. And not just in terms of golf balls and manufacturing, but also with course setups. We can make the game more nuanced, interesting to watch at the highest level. We can test the best players in a different way and make the game more captivating to follow. Because no one can tell me that golf wasn't more interesting 20, 30, 40 years ago than what it is now. And we're not even going back that far. We're going back probably 15, 20 years. And and even then, in 10, 15 years' time, they've already touched on this, we might have to revise it again. So it'll be an ongoing discussion. But clearly, the brakes have to be put on because the hor horse has bolted out of the stable. And right now, we can't even catch it. So we have to get a you know get our lasso around the horse and just slow it down. So I'm you know 100% for this. Uh, Mike, uh... Kieran mentioned uh, Titleist uh, taking kind of a, a, an anti-stance on this. And I'll read the, David Marr, the president uh, and CEO of Kushnet, who is the parent company of Titleist, said, playing by a unified set of rules is an essential part of the game's allure, contributes to its global understanding and appeal, and eliminates the inconsistency and instability that would come from multiple sets of equipment standards. Unification is a powerfully positive force in the game. And we believe that equipment bifurcation would be detrimental to golf's long-term well-being. As a result, we will actively participate in this conversation with the governing bodies worldwide, professional tours, PGA professional organizations, amateur associations and federations, and golfers in an effort to contribute to the continued enjoyment and growth of the game. Mike, the original question was, amateur golfers, casual golfers want to play the same course and the same ball as the pros play when they go and they spend three, four, five hundred dollars to play one of these golf courses. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that when, uh, I mean, when I play golf, I generally speaking, don't play from the back tees unless it's, uh, you know, not more than say 6,500 yards. Many times I, I look back and go, I'm glad I'm not hitting from back there. Um, but I just think that the stance of Titleist is a good one. Uh, with the exception of Tiger, there's no player in the world who's just dominating the game uh, to the point that it's not competitive. I just think we have a situation in golf where there's just a glut of great players who have taken the time to uh, learn the game and perfect the game and let them um, let them be who they are and let's not put those brakes on them. I um, I think the amateurs are more interested in hitting approach shots from the same parts of the fairway, not necessarily drives. But uh, again, I just think that we have a, a create a double standard of sport is just not a good idea. Let's let the best be the best and uh, let the rest of us um, 
stand in amazement and uh, try to try to reach their standard. Uh, about six years ago, uh, one of the leading golfers, uh, when this ball thing kind of got heated up several years ago, uh, uh, this golfer made this statement. Um, using an analogy of baseball, there's no reason why we can't be like baseball and have a line of demarcation between college or amateur and the professional ranks, which would be, say, the minor leagues all the way up to the bigs. My idea was to have it so every professional would have to play a reduced flight ball. Even if you played a pro member, you would have a reduced flight ball for the pro and have to play with that type of ball. Whereas the amateur, go ahead, make it fun. Juice the balls up. Juice the clubs up. Let them have a great time. But at a professional level, I see no reason why we can't have it very similar to where baseball has it right now. And so I'll, I'll tell you, that was Tiger Woods mm -hmm. back in yep. 2017, okay? So this is not a new argument. The USGA and the RNIA have been looking at this for well over 20 years. They have uh, been putting out data and different charts and graphs and things showing that the, the distance is growing on an average of about uh, three to four yards a year. Some years not, but on the average over a 15-year span, that's, that's what we get. So this has become a serious issue, especially for golf courses trying to, to remain relevant uh, for, I mean, you've got places like Marion, just they're landlocked. They have no place to go. Now they did it. They did a great job with the U S open a couple of years ago, but are they going to be able to do that again in, in uh, four or five years time? Well, that's, that's really the big issue and where this stuff is coming from. So guys, uh, I think we'll just, uh, we, we covered all the points. Um, and I'll just ask you one real quick question here. Uh, so this rule won't have any real effect for amateur and casual golfers. It only affects pros and elite amateurs. In the end, won't we get used to this difference and wonder why everyone made such a big deal out of it in the first place? Or are we going to see lawsuits littering the media headlines for the next couple of years like we did with the Ping Square Group fiasco 20 years ago? Mike, I'll ask you this, let you reply to this question first. Um. I think that we uh, we will eventually get used to it, but um, I just think that um, uh, well, first of all, I, I don't want to go out playing golf and try to find and happen to find a, a pro's golf ball because it's faulty compared to what I'm using. So, uh, <laughs> but I but I, I do if there is going to be a move, these balls have to be marked in a way so that there's we eliminate. Um, the aspect of cheating i hate to bring that up but if there's a certain mark on the ball that says pro only or whatever or a logo who's to stop someone from taking a high performance ball of today and having that logo put on there so to the naked eye it looks like oh this is a pro conforming ball unless we do testing on literally every tee at every venue who's to stop a player from bringing out a ball out of his bag but I know I know golf is a game of integrity, but uh, we've had issues with baseball and cork bats, and I uh, the allure to win may cause people to cross the line. And again, I th I think it creates a fuzzy area that we're never going to get used to. Here, the, the, kind of the same question for you, Kerry. And uh, over time, uh, and you're you're for this uh, kind of in in the first place. So over yeah. time, won't we all kind of get used to it anyway? Of course, and I mentioned earlier, Fred, where I think right now we're in the, the hot take reaction uh, stage of this this whole debate now. It's just been less than a week uh, as we're recording it now. So we're in that kind of reactionary phase, which is never the best phase. But I think over time, there will be nuance and discussion that come into these things. And like any change, we get used to it. You mentioned the grooves before, Fred. We get used to that. We get used to the anchored putting. We get used to that. You know, all these things that evolve with time. And I think what will be interesting coming ahead will be at Augusta National this year at the Masters when the chairman, Fred Ridley, talks to the media. Are they for this? Is Augusta National... Well, they, we've heard before about a tournament ball for the Masters. If they're going to be all for it, which I think they probably will be, um, then I think that's the argument closed when it comes to the professional game because all the tour players, they want to play the Masters. They want to play the Open, the US Open. And if those events are going to be at that level and use these new balls, then... That's, I think, uh, a clear distinction as to where we are. The tour itself will, I think, eventually fall into line as the years go on. But yeah, it'll be a, a big discussion, a big debate as the years go on. It's not going to happen next week or tomorrow. 
it's a long way to go in this whole whole issue, but I do think we're going to get to a stage where there will be bifurcation to some degree. It might only be in the majors, who knows, but I think that would be a bad move for the tour as well, because actually I think it would make the majors even bigger and better than what they are already. And to be fair, the divide between the major championships in golf right now and tour level golf is expanding all the time because of all the fractured nature of it right now. And that would only exacerbate that problem for them. So but as I say, it's about the business of golf versus the, the game of golf. I'm for the game, not so much the business. And I think we get to get that balance right. They go hand in hand, obviously. But right now, I think the business of golf has had a good run for the last few decades. It's time to kind of just say, you know what? You're going, you're going too far. And it's time to find another way. And I think this is the first step in a, a long discussion to get to what I hope will be a better future for uh, professional golf. But of course, the game as a whole will still be as it is. We really want to thank Kieran Clark, who is coming to us live today from St. Andrews in Scotland, right by the old course. And, of course, Mike May, chief editor of Indiana Golf Journal and golf writer extraordinaire. Uh, guys, thanks a lot for, for coming in today and, thank you. and covering this topic. You're Pleasure. Welcome. Thank you.